From Software is known for crafting the greatest boss fights in game, and the big man Michael Zaki always saves the best for the DLC. And today we'll see if Shadow of the Earth Tree lives up to that golden standard by ranking every Remembrance boss from worst to best. Spoilers ahead, if you haven't finished the DLC, turn back now. Depths of your foolishness! The worst Remembrance boss has to be Commander Gaius. He's just undercooked. The charge attack was easier to dodge than players made it out to be. However, I can't deny it was on some Dark Souls 2 level hitboxes. Apart from that, he felt like a pretty standard mounted fight. Although that one combo where the pig goes hog wild was a pain in my ass. Homeless asshole probably fucked his pig. So sick of your I don't fuck my pig. You'll want to hit exceptionally hard to break his stance. I switched back to Old Reliable to show him who was boss. Honestly, I was shocked when he dropped his remembrance. I thought I was fighting a mini boss, especially since he has a recycled music track. I'd be less critical if that was the case. They have patched Gaius' hitboxes since I fought him, so maybe he'll be less of a pain to fight in the future. I can't believe they made the Spy Kid's thumb into a boss. I'm conflicted on where to put me to Mother of Fingers in the ranking. The lore and build up to the boss fight feels like a culmination of the story from the base game. Her eldritch design reminds you how much Elden Ring has in common with Bloodborne, leaning into cosmic horror. However, the fight with Mita is pretty meta. <laughs> I'll see myself out. Mita herself makes this fight easier by forcing you in front of her weak spot. As if you linger on her size, she'll finger you. She does ramp the difficulty up in phase two when she turns into a biblically accurate angel and starts beyblading around the arena and letting off explosions. However, if you get hit, there's plenty of time to heal between attacks. So she was on the easier side of the DLC bosses. She loses points for summoning finger creepers as well because like, just why? No boss is improved by adding finger creepers. You ever look at Gale and think, you know what would make this even better? Finger creepers. Keep your hands to yourself. Next up is Divine Beast Dancing Lion. Sounds like a character straight out of Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> the carnival puppet design goes incredibly hard and there is a good boss here somewhere in the rough. This was my warm up for the DLC and man it was intense setting the tone for what to expect. I love that the lion unlocks new moves and varies existing ones depending on what element he's using, creating a steep learning curve that keeps players on edge. However, the fight is held back by some technical issues. Blair Witch called, they want their cameraman back. I think I died more times to the camera having a seizure than due to any mistake I made. Oh, precursor, you could just not lock on. And you'd be right, but with how much this boss flies around, I feel like you need to lock on to keep track of him. I also experienced some frame dips because of how much is on screen at one moment. This this is a skill issue, but Dancing Lion often appeared as a blur on my screen, and I struggled to follow his actions. I wonder if he would have been better suited to a later stage in the DLC, given the fight's high mechanical demands and need for pixel-perfect positioning. Ramina was a little unremarkable. Elden Ring has conditioned me to constantly being attacked, and at times Ramina felt passive by comparison. It was nice to have a slower paced fight with well telegraphed attacks. Her simpler moveset was a nice breather, with her being sandwiched between Mesmer and Radan. Her only vaguely threatening move is the butterfly explosion that inflicts Scarlet Rot. I'm not a massive fan of bosses inflicting status effects, I find it irritating. She had milk and cross eyed for most of the fight, but when my eyes met in the middle, there she was. Now I finally have them all. I also appreciate the visual cues on her model for certain attacks, such as the pink flash before her ground pound. I think more bosses could benefit from audio visual cues. Somehow Rodan returned. I'm very conflicted about where to place Rodan on this list. Phase 1 is nearly perfect, easy to read with plenty of damage windows and combo variations to keep you on your toes. The only issue I have is the triple horizontal slash. It is possible to dodge it. No, I don't know how to. I will try and be objective with phase two. It's visually a mess. There's too much visual effects on screen and the Michaelester's hair obscures many of Rodan's animations. Congratulations to my boy Moog for beating the allegations. I'm sorry for doubting you. Visual clutter is not a good way to increase the difficulty of a boss. Ironically, many of the attacks I struggled with were present in phase one. Only now the golden rays made it impossible for me to understand what was happening. And I reached a point fighting Radam where I accepted. I simply do not have the mechanical skill required to beat I the second can't, phase. I can't, I can't, I can't. So even when I defeated Radan solo, I didn't feel a sense of achievement when I won. Only relief that it was over. If they bring out a Mick of the buzz cut patch or tone down the VFX, I might fare better. But for now, this boss is not for me, and it left a sour taste in my mouth at the end of what was otherwise a perfect DLC. 
This may be polarizing, but next up is Rolana, Twin Moon Knight. Rolana has a high skill ceiling for finding openings in her relentless combos. Her smooth animations and hitboxes reward good positioning, which you'll need because she is brutal. Jump her moon AoE for an easier time and use lightning as the water in the arena amplifies the damage. This environmental interaction pops up several times in the DLC, which I really enjoy. Shadow of the Earth Tree encourages build experimentation. I found myself trying combinations and consumables I'd never use in the base game. I spent enough runes on boiled crab for Bogger to set up bubblegum shrimp in Leonia. Rolana's second phase ups the ante, increasing her reach and giving her some nasty ranged attacks. She had me stressing as it feels like she never stops attacking you. Her elemental combos remind me of someone. Died 2016, born 2024. Welcome back, Pontus Sullivan. Rolana is the boss I'm most looking forward to fighting again, as I don't feel like I got a good handle on her combos. I think I'd find more of a flow fighting her with a dex build, and I can see her climbing my ranking in the future. Discovering the Shadow Tree Avatars Arena was a highlight of the DLC for me. I bumbled to the tree's base and realized I wasn't being poisoned or rotted by the sap on the floor. Am I the only one that wants to take a bath in it? only to promptly shit myself when the pissed off sunflower came to life. The avatar is well tuned, with attacks evolving as the difficulty ramps up across its three phases. Most of Shadow's bosses excel in this. They ease you into the fight, using the word ease loosely. You learn basic moves before the difficulty and aggression ramps up with new attacks and variations. For example, his homing magic projectile changes through each phase, requiring different dodge timings to avoid. I can imagine Miyazaki laughing at everyone reacting to him getting up for a third phase. <laughs> <laughs> the only attack I struggled with was the AoE explosion in Phase 3. The timing is honestly evil. You might just want to up your holy resist and tank it, otherwise the Shadow Tree Avatar is a very manageable boss. The build-up to the Protrescent Knight was incredible. The descent into the cage at the end of the map builds up the fear of the unknown. The classic from soft plunge into the abyss tells you a banger of a boss awaits. I remember seeing this goober in the trailer and thinking, that looks stupid. Never have I been so wrong. PK's design needs to be studied. The way he dismounts and incorporates the horse into his combos is creative. There's a nice rhythm to this fight that makes his attack satisfying to dodge. The blue flame ruined me to start with. However, once I realized you were supposed to jump it, the fight became much much more enjoyable. It makes the encounter so much easier. He hits like a truck, but his health bar is on the lighter side to compensate. The only issue with this guy is spacing. Sometimes the knight's combos leave him slightly out of reach, causing you to miss your attack window. But it's something you can work around, and it doesn't subtract from the quality of the fight. Midra is the hardest boss in Shadow of the Earth Tree. I never understood the complaints about the DLC's difficulty until I saw Midra's first phase. His attack pattern was insane. His small stature and hitboxes make him almost impossible to hit. You'll want to keep him at mid-range as he utilizes the Howl of Shabriri, causing madness build-up. However, be ready to dodge as you'll be at prime distance to trigger his grab attack. Miyazaki, nerf Midra and my life is yours. Sarcasm. Jokes aside, Midra was one of my favorite bosses in the DLC. It was cool to see FromSoft experiment with the area leading up to him, turning Elden Ring into a horror game. He's just standing there, menacingly. The atmosphere of the woods leading into the mansion had me on edge. Having a Lord of Frenzied Flame boss almost felt like fan service. Midra moves slowly with purpose. Each swing is well telegraphed with precise dodge timings. And he closes the distance rapidly if you try to back up and heal. He feels like an old school Dark Souls boss. I know I said I didn't like bosses employing status effects, but it isn't overly oppressive here. And I think I only mauled it once the entire time I was fighting him. Oh dear, we are in trouble. The only thing stopping me from ranking him higher is how easily he staggers. Seriously, I lost count of how many times I unintended intentionally broke his poise. Also, I wish there was a special interaction if you had inherited the frenzied flame from the Three Fingers. My penultimate pick is that dragon. What was his name again? I will riddle with holes your rotten hide. Bale was an absolute treat. I love how FromSoft keeps one-upping their dragon fights. Bale is the best example of difficulty not overshadowing the overall fight. Every time I died to Bale, I felt like it was my fault. The philosophy of Elden Ring boss design has always been positioning heavy, and Bale is the pinnacle of that. Although his lightning AoEs can be a bit much once he has transformed, learning optimal positioning for each attack is rewarding. He plays similar to Medea, with the best strategy being locking onto his head and standing in front of it, rather than going for the leg or leg. Sorry, Bale. <laughs> 
If you're struggling, the Dragon Katana comes in clutch here. The Ash of War can make short work of his girthy health bar. Mesmer the Impaler is my pick for the best boss in Shadow of the Earth Tree. The poster boy of the DLC certainly lived up to the hype. Mesmer's moves are intuitive, making it easy to understand and dodge his attacks. However, he is no pushover. The challenge lies in the sheer number of combos and distance Mesmer can cover in his assault. Despite his relentless attacks, the fight feels fair. Then he gets his big snake out. The transformations in Phase 2 fit seamlessly into the fight, adding both spectacle and terror. However, Phase 2 may be easier than Phase 1. Although he zooms around the arena, the snakes are simple to dodge and provide a generous attack window. Nuclear take. Mesmer should have had two health bars. Like Morgoth in the base game, the fight was over too quickly if you explored thoroughly. And I think wanting more shows how good of a boss he was. Agree? Disagree? Post your ranking in the comments below and keep an eye out for the next video where I'll be ranking the side bosses from Shadow of the Earth Tree. Take it easy and I'll see you on the next one.